joining us today. Um, we're really excited about this session. Um, just a reminder, we're recording today. So if you would like to turn off um, your videos or change your name, um, if you wouldn't like to be recognized, that's absolutely fine. Um, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to uh, Sister Margaret Barrett. Thank you, Rihanna. And good morning again to everyone. Thank you so much for your fidelity and your, um, your appreciation this week. Your texts and your emails have been really valued. Thank you for that. So we're happy to gather again today. This is our fourth day of our um, Daughters of Charity Services Vincentian Values Week. And today we have the, um, the joy and the privilege of welcoming, welcoming Margot, Margot Uprichard from Glasgow. When Margot graduated from university, she spent the first 20 years of her professional life working in the NHS as a microbiologist, and then did some further studies and moved into the, the social care sector. And then um, having worked with a charity um, in Scotland, she then joined as CEO of the Louise Project in Glasgow. And she has done some amazing um, development within that project, reaching out to the people of Govan and the environs um, in Glasgow. And we're really looking forward to Margot. We appreciate the fact that Margot is here this morning, having just suffered the death of a very dear and a very skilled colleague in the team in the Louise Project. So we extend our sympathies, um, Margot, in welcoming you here this morning. Welcome, Margot. Thank you, Margot. Thank you, Sister Margaret. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Oh, that's good. Um, yes, and thank you for all the kind words. The team have greatly appreciated it at this time. And, um, we were just so privileged, so privileged to know Fiona. Mm. But uh, I'm going to talk about um, enabling choice and change. And really to start off with, what I need to do is give you a foundation to really understand what in our experience has had to be there and be the life of the project before you could even contemplate enabling choice and change. Rihanna, I want to share my screen, so... Um, um, so you should be able to, I think, um, your, your co-host, so... Okay, can people see that? Not no. yet, Marco. Um, are you sure? I, are you sure I'm enabled, um, Rihanna? Yeah. So, um, have you got the um, share screen bo uh, button at the bottom? Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, if you click on that, um, yep. does your it pop up? Some options for some pages. Yeah, should pop I mean, up. I've got I've got multiple at a time. That's it. And then click on the one that you want to share. And yeah, yeah. Press share and it should work. Oh dear. Okay, do people have it now? No, nope. not yet, um, Marco. Okay. Um, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Um, so if you can just bear with me then, I can, uh, I can really just talk about this because, um, and I can send out the presentation later, Rihanna. Yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. absolutely. That, it's that's not coming fine. on the screen. Yeah. So for those who know the project well, if you'll just bear with me, um, some of this you'll know very well. 
The project started as a pilot in 2013, but really and truly its conception was even several years before then when the daughters were reviewing their mission call to serve. And in doing so, the area of Govan Hill was identified in Glasgow. Um, and as that was an area that they didn't have a great deal of experience with, they decided to set up a pilot project called The Space. And really, The Space was all about offering a place to people where they would be heard. It was a place where people would be enabled and helped to have their needs met. And it was a space where, first and foremost, we were a ministry of presence. So it was about being there for people and being alongside them in their poverty. And one of the things that was instrumental really in determining the whole shape of the project were the Vincentian values. And for, for us in the space, we identified some core values and they were truthfulness, gentleness, kindness, compassion, and accountability. And above all, honoring the dignity of every person that came to the project. And we asked each person that came into the project to, to honor those values as the team honored them. So as we lived them, so we asked others to live them too. So it was the most amazing gift because what happened was the daughters decided that the pilot would run for 18 months. So during that 18 months, we were there. We weren't confined by anything in particular other than be present, listen, and serve. And after 18 months, all of the, the work that had been done, all of the support was then collated, studied, and formulated into what was a strategy, a way forward. And it was really deemed at that point that because of the impact of the project and also the persistent and intense poverty that the pilot should become a project and a project in its own right. And at that point, the daughters formed the Louise project. And they also moved the project to premises not far from the original shop front site. So the Louise project was set up and the whole remit, everything that we were here to do was really about enabling the families to flourish and enabling the community that we were based in to thrive. So the Louise project focused on a number of wider, wider issues. It was to continue the development, the work of the space that had been started in Allison Street in Govan Hill. It was to look at building enterprise and by enterprise, that is about a social business to enhance and strengthen the sustainability of the project. It's about supported employment to those that we support. And it's also about enabling people to volunteer. In addition, we also have another arm that looks at building for social justice. And that is about new poverties um, that come to light. It's about displaced peoples, perhaps, that we might start to encounter um, in a very short period of time. It's for us, it's about youth poverty and also people trafficking has never, is never far from this community. So we basically, the, the space is the one initiative that at the moment 
is the most developed. And it has continued to develop, evolve and change, especially in the last 18 months to, to two years. For the space, our, our mantra, if you like, for the space was a warm welcome, a listening ear and a place to be. And within that, there are a number of key pieces of work. We have what we call a community drop-in, community integration. We have building better futures and we have building community. And essentially, um, the community drop-in is about the relationship. It's about getting to know people. It's about the invitation to be here. One of the key things that we have achieved as part of the space is we offer people a place where they are safe to be vulnerable. And in this community, that's immense, absolutely immense for people from all walks of life, from people of all faiths and none. So it's about a place to be sociable in the drop-in. Families come in, they can have their tea, their coffee, they will get support. That might take 10 minutes, it might take three months, but they're still sitting there usually an hour or two after. Just being sociable because within this particular area, the people that we would be serving will be within the poorest five to 10% of the Scottish population. Govan Hill, it's the most ethnically diverse area in the whole of Scotland. There are well over 50 languages spoken and certainly the dominant group are the European Roma community, which now is largely, well, it's the Romanian community, but it's also the Slovakian, the Czech community. There will be some Bulgarians, um, and we occasionally get some from Russian states. But the project, the, the reach is now wider, and I can come on to explain some of that. But well, what I would say is that drop-in, which sounds, which really sounds quite innocuous, it's just a drop-in, but that drop-in and those values are the foundation that created the opportunity for everything else to happen. The people that come here for the women, um, you know, this is their, this is them going for a coffee and cake with friends. They don't go to coffee shops in the area. Many of them wouldn't get in. So this is their coffee morning. It's meeting up. It's being sociable. It's being accepted. It's being supported. But ultimately, through the integration work and through building better futures, hopefully it then becomes about them being enabled for them to build a better life and for them to start dealing with problems. A lot of the work in the relationship is about home visits. Now, I will come on to the impact of the pandemic, but the home visit was essential. Poverty is a, poverty is a, is a heinous crime against humanity, and people in poverty need to survive. And in Govan Hill, with such intense poverty, people do what they need to to survive. But you can go to people's homes and there you will get a real sense of family dynamics. You will get a real picture, an honest picture of the poverty and of the relationships within the home. One of the things that we're very key on is within building better futures is to try and enable the people themselves to actually, to better themselves, to aspire and to move on. You know, I was really quite naive when I started in Alison Street. 
because I've I very clearly thought all I have to do is get these people to aspire to a better life and then we're that's us we're on the journey but then with sister Agnes and I then we soon realized that people didn't aspire because they didn't dream of anything better because they didn't think they could because for most everything they knew about the world someone else had told them they had never read a book or a newspaper they didn't understand what was being said in the television because they didn't understand the language they were illiterate in their own language so everything they knew about the world somebody else had told them and usually they, that person had never read anything either so there's a lot of superstition, there's a lot of old wives tales and many of which have absolutely no bearing on truth. But we firmly believe, I certainly firmly believe within the project and, and so do the team, that people can hear the truth when it's said with gentleness and with regard for the other. They can hear hard truths. So if in fact somebody comes along and they're spinning you the biggest yarn under the planet, it's okay to say, do you know what? I just don't buy this. I don't, I, I'm not believing this. So please go away, think about what you're saying. But the door's always open. It's always open. You can always come back and we'll always listen. But if we don't believe you, then we need to be honest with each other. It's the honesty and accountability. And what I want to do is to actually to start thinking about the charism. So here we have this space. And what it does in this space is it allows you to, to be alongside people, to be present. And it allows you to address the immediate poverty. So if people don't have their basic material needs, um, then enable them to get them. You know, we, we put them in, we, we enable them to access what they need. And by some mystery, a very divine mystery, everything always turns up, everything we need always appears. Um, and for me, that's an essential part of the charism. Be there alongside them and enable them to meet their needs, to honour their dignity in their poverty. But then I think the next part of the charism, and this, this really shaped the whole growth of the project because I thought, right, we're alongside people. The poverty is persistent. It's, it's terrible. It's horrible. We've got all these resources coming in. We're enabling people to have what they need, but now we need to enable them to meet their own needs. So for, for us here, the next part of the charism was about the, the enablement of the individual, enable them to do it. And that's where now things like community integration, they can come in and if they've got a problem, you know, they need help with something, a doctor's appointment, a dental appointment, a forum. If they are now at a stage where they can do it, well, they encourage you do it. They will get support and help, but they have to do it. With building better futures, they have to learn to read and write. They've got to learn to count. Simple thing. We soon realised that they thought 20, 20 pence was more than one pound because 20 is a bigger number. So they couldn't count their change, they couldn't count their shopping. But now, many can count and many have a, a very basic literacy. And so what we felt was, okay, so we're now enabling people to, to be able to, to manage day-to-day -day problems. But in terms of the, them becoming independent, that really means access to work. It means access to legal contracts. And um, what they then very naively thought was, 
oh, well, you see, it'll be fine, because if we can just get them with basic literacy skills, then I can just phone up the area manager for little and start getting everybody filling in dog forms and we get them into entry level work. We were in this place, oh, about three years ago. We had people with basic literacy and then we realized, do you know what, they are never work ready. They are never going to be able to hold down a legal contract. And that's when we created this supported employment opportunities within the project. And pre-COVID, we started to look at ironing. So we got a professional ironing station. We got women volunteered to get trained and we started doing light touch ironing and the women were starting to get some money. Um, we then, we have what we call, we, we have a project shop and on a Wednesday, Essentially, rather than just being given resources, now what they do is they can buy resources that they need, but they can buy them at a price that they can afford. So when families come to us, there are some we know where we just have to put resources in. And if that's where we're at, that's what happens. But there are also some that we know for whom they have risen above that, that level and they can pay something. So they come to the project shop and they can buy, you know, um, bottles of shampoo that you'll go to the supermarket and pay two pounds. Here they buy it for a pound. Soap powder that they would be, you know, paying three pounds for, they might buy it for a pound. Other things they'll buy for 50 pence nappies. So daily items that, that are really very expensive, toiletries, hygiene, uh, cleaning issues, all of that, cleaning resources, all of that, they will buy a fraction of the price that they will in the shops. And the other thing you need to remember is this is retail therapy. And I put my hand up, I love retail therapy. So basically, we also, we don't accept, I tell people, we do not accept anything secondhand, um, but we have some very good allies in the project and we do get some things that are just almost new and the women just love that. So they will buy, you know, clothing, they will buy household items um, and the shop has to be ticketed. Um, because obviously now uh, we are very strict in how many we allow in at a time. But even pre-COVID, we had to tick it because it was so busy. And every resource that we need, we are able to get. So the Roma women run the project shop. Half the team are now from the Roma community. But to run the project shop, that means they can count, they can read, they can write. It means they can plan and organise stock. And also, they run the, we use an ASDA app for doing shopping, and they run the ASDA app. So basically, as far as we're concerned in the project, yes, we can see that people are actually being enabled. So all the time, underpinning all of this, you've got choice being enabled, um, and whatever choice they make, I have to say to, you know, we have to be very aware that we provide a great deal of advocacy and it's about ensuring people know what their options are. They know all the pros and cons of each option. And whatever they decide is their choice. It might not be what we would recommend, but it's their choice. And, that, and that's what advocacy is about. In terms of the charism, and I'll come back to this later, the third aspect to it, so be alongside them, enable them to become independent, but then tackle the systems that keep them poor. And that's where I suppose our input um, in that area is much more, it's newer, but it's actually happening. And I can talk about that a bit later. 
I want to go on and talk a little bit about the response to the pandemic. And the bottom line is there was no furlough here because furlough is for those with legal contracts and that doesn't happen for our families. There was very little understanding of what was happening because many couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't understand English, they weren't able to communicate. No doctors, no schools, no statutory services, no work, and no money. Really, no one was available. But we were, um, we never closed our doors, except for two weeks in March, when I had to sit with the most splitting headache and think, what on earth are we doing now, Lord? And something came to mind that, um, Someone had said to me a long time ago, do not confuse the vehicle for the journey. Don't confuse the mechanisms you employ to bring about difference with the difference you want to make. So for two weeks, we had to really think. We were doing all these really exciting things with drop-ins and arts and crafts and well-being and they were making aromatherapy products and they were doing ironing and you know they were running a shop and all of that had to stop but the point was we had to go back we had to go back to being a ministry of presence that's what we started off as and that's what we went back to. So our values, our charism, and I'm making a claim on it. <laughs> our charism meant be present and be alongside them and meet their needs. And so in response to the needs at that time, the, we set up a crisis support service, online information service, a digital inclusion uh, service, and a pastoral care line, which the Daughters of Charity did for us in the community and in, across the city. And essentially, I suppose in that, in a 20, 18 months, there was over three and a half thousand crisis issues addressed, food shortages, no people with no gas, no electric, domestic violence, illegal evictions that landlords were trying to push forward with, access to healthcare, dentists, hospitals, um, social housing, private landlord repairs, welfare benefit claims. Uh, it was incessant. But also in that time, through our digital program, 41 families got um, an iPad or a tablet device. They all got access to the internet. 20 restarted their education online. They engaged in well-being sessions, in art and craft sessions, they connected with each other and, and they really, really got on with life, which was quite amazing. We had um, one woman who brought in a school report with a, a QR code on it from the school. She was taught how to use the QR code with her iPad. She was taught how to link in with the school. And she, she was absolutely thrilled. And she said, my children are now so clever. And we pointed out, your children were always clever. But now she's able to engage with the school. After some of the wellbeing sessions, people saying, I feel normal after this. 
and an outside worker from the other side of the city who connected, I think it was a Syrian family with us. Um, and they just were so overwhelmed, they said, by the generosity and the speed with which we put resources in, we got the women connected into the project and linking into what was happening. There have been, I suppose, many things within the project that, that really touch our heart. Um, in terms of some of the, the systemic issues, what we've found in working with DC services is that, in fact, some of the issues were not systemic. They're actually down to people, people who who have control and who are maybe just very racist in their attitudes or for whatever reason just want to be mean and not help. And that's things like refusing to register mums and children with a GP. We had that, Agnes and I had that when we started. And lo and behold, did it not raise its ugly head recently? When, it, when we first came across it, we got in contact with the Director for Public Health, who we invited to the project, and we said, they're saying it's a legal requirement. She checked it all out and said, indeed, it is not a legal requirement to have an address. So they were saying, no proof of address, no doctor. Of course, the women and children don't have proof of address. So yet again, oh, about a month or so ago, it raised its ugly head again. They were refusing to, to register children. So needless to say, we sent off an, uh, the appropriate communication and, and, and put that to rights. Um, but now they're actually being quite mean with us um, because they're saying, well, if we don't prove proof of address, don't ask us to prove that they've been here for settled status. Just being mean. Enabling transformation and change. And everything I've talked about is really all about enabling transformation. It's the people themselves that will transform the community and they do it by transforming themselves. And we enable people to do that by enabling them to grow, by enabling them to recognize their own giftedness to recognise their own preciousness, to recognise the beauty within. And to get them to realise that life was actually never meant to be like this. You know, poverty is a man-made phenomenon. It's not divine. It was never created. We did that, mankind. And the world was never meant to be like this. There's mountain loads of money. It's just that it's not evenly divided. It's just some people who keep it all to themselves. So it's about getting people to believe in themselves that they are real and agents of change and can be real agents of change in their own life and in the community in which they live. There are many, many hands to the plough in this project. I mean, locally, we get great support from organisations around about us who we work in partnership with, um, especially during the time of the pandemic when we were the only ones to be open in the area. But also alongside us, our DC services, who I draw on frequently. Um, I draw on and I depend on quite significantly at times. Also the Society of St Vincent de Paul. The daughters themselves 
we couldn't have done the pastoral care. And the pastoral care wasn't heavily used in terms of numbers, number of people supported. But for the people that were supported, it was the lifeline. And I suppose the whole point is about the project, it's about looking at the charism, looking about looking at what I would see the three aspects of it and ensuring that in everything that we do, we are addressing those three parts of the charism. Recently, we've started to work alongside and with the NHS. Um, to look at the Scottish National um, Records Office because the census will be out next year and try to identify barriers that will prevent people from in participating. So that I think is a that, that's actually quite momentous because at least at least they're actually wanting to identify the barriers. Now what I'm saying to them is, okay, we've done all this with you. Now what are you going to do about it? Now are you going to work with us to try and, and stop it happening? Because at least we've alerted you to it. We've been working with the NHS of late in terms of cancer screening, where there is very, very low uptake in any tests by some of the ethnic communities. And some of our team have been making videos on cancer screening to put them out to different groups. And so I think there is a real, there's a movement now within the project to really look at the more systemic issues. But that's, I mean, that's something that, um, that's something that will continue. Sorry, I don't know if you can still see me. <laughs> but I suppose what I would say is in terms of enabling choice and change, it is about those three aspects. And it's about ensuring whatever you do, you're underpinning each aspect and you're enabling all the time and you're in partnership with as many as possible because you will quickly learn that you need to trust others to do it. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> I went over a little bit, Rihanna, not much. That's absolutely no problem at all. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Margot. I'm just going to hand over to Mark quickly. Um, Margot, just to say thank you so much um, for such a fantastic insight into the work that goes on. Um, I think from what you've said, it's quite clear from the very outset, from the very, very beginnings with yourself and Sister Agnes, the values and the charism, it's been evident in all of the work undertaken and how that work's been undertaken as well. It's, and it's so apparent. I think your commitment to enabling right the way through just jumped out again this morning. Um, every step of the road that they travel, that you travel with the people who come through your doors, it, it serves a meaningful purpose, but it's done with such gentleness and kindness and love that it feels more supportive um, than anything else. As Vincentians, we speak about the need for organised charity. And I think we can be very confident that it's organised at the Louise Project in everything that's done. Everything has a reason and it serves as a chance to transform, like you say, not just themselves, the people who come through your doors, but their families and the community as well, as you say. Something I've noticed that the space, as it started another Louise Project, it speaks so often about serving as a place to be. But I think it also serves very, very well as a place to become. Um, to become literate, to become educated, to become ready to find legal work, to become equipped to engage with schools, like you said, and shops and services out in the community, to become an agent of change in your own lives and in the lives of your families as well. We know Margot and the whole Louise Project as such an active participant within the Daughters of Charity Services group, but we also know that with you work with the SVP and everybody else, you're such an active participant in the wider Vincentian family as well. And I think we can be fairly confident if anyone wants to know what the Vincentian charism looks like in the 21st century, we can we can point them towards Govan Hill and say, take a look. Thank you, Margot, for such an inspiring insight this morning into what takes place there. It's 
it's the place that we miss terribly and we cannot wait to visit again when things open up but it's it's always inspiring um to hear about how how alive to the values and charism all of the work that takes place is so thank you um just to say to everybody else um as well we uh, we've been plowing through the week um tomorrow morning is the final session um at 10 o'clock um so please do join us then as well um sister ellen is going to reflect on what we've heard this week um, around the Vincentian values in practice across the group and across the family um, and also hope us help to look towards uh, towards the next steps what they are to sustain and maybe even grow the shared values that lie at the heart of all we do so please do join at 10 o'clock tomorrow but in the meantime just to say Margot thank you so much for this morning thank you thank you so much Mark and Mandy and thank you to everyone again for joining us. Um, and as Mark said, we hope to see you tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.